Analytic, we develop clinical applications of artificial intelligence aimed at enabling doctors to provide faster, earlier, and more accurate diagnoses. And while we're actively researching a wide array of uh, research areas within digital diagnostics, our core focus right now is primarily in radiology. Uh, but why is that? Well, radiologists play a particular cornerstone role in the majority of diagnostic pipelines, and already existing in a largely digital environment, they happen to be among the most technologically forward-thinking uh, of doctors. But most of all, they very much need help. Uh, nearly half a billion people this year alone will get an X-ray, ultrasound, CT, or MRI. Uh, unfortunately, roughly one in five will be misdiagnosed, meaning they might receive treatment they don't even need. Another one in four might have their diagnosis missed altogether, meaning they may never receive treatment they desperately need. This means millions in preventable deaths and billions in preventable costs. And atop all that, nearly five billion people around the world lack access to high-quality radiologists altogether. Now, radiology is increasingly getting more and more difficult as there is increasing pressure from the market for radiologists to read more and more scans in less and less amount of time. And that increases the need for us to provide these solutions for them in order to do a more effective job. Over the course of the remainder of this talk, I'd like to show you a few concrete examples of tools we've built to help solve these problems, and ideally give you an idea of roughly how we've built those systems. But I'd like to start by emphasizing a key point, that this is not about man versus machine, but this should be about man plus machine, and how together they can offer substantially better care. We should be far more concerned about how we can enable our current radiologists to serve the five billion people that don't have access to them long before we care about how to do away with them altogether. And <clears throat> uh, on that note, uh, I would, <clears throat> sorry, uh, as a software engineer, uh, I've had the benefit of having magical AI systems like this help me for nearly a decade. Uh, in particular, tools like Google. When I'm writing a particular code or a program, I can Google in natural language my specific problem. And it will serve me the most relevant pages, probably Stack Overflow, where somebody already wrote a snippet of code that I'm looking for. I can paste it into my code and tune it until it works. Google did not replace me, but it did save me the trouble of having to reinvent the wheel, which opened me up to have a lot more time to spend on things that are much better suited for my talents as a person, like figuring out what problems are worth solving in the first place. Radiology is going to be a lot more like this, especially in the near future. But what does building AI for radiology look like? Well, very similar to building AI for anything else. Uh, I know a lot of this has been covered by previous speakers, but they say deep learning is a black box, and honestly, it's not an unfair characterization, though it is one that in healthcare makes us very uncomfortable. Deep learning algorithms are very good at extracting a relevant output, or Y, from a relevant unstructured input, or X. Now, they say it's inspired by the way, at least we understand, that the human brain works, and it's very similar in its limitations. We can prove empirically that the black box gets the right answer most of the time, but it takes a lot of work to try to get any sense of the steps involved in getting there. Uh, unfortunately, while that makes us, again, very uncomfortable in healthcare, it's a reality that largely we're gonna have to deal with. Uh, but it's not too dissimilar from how we deal with people already. If I were to ask everybody in this room what color my shirt is, in that scenario, your brain would be the black box, X would be the photons bouncing off my shirt into your eyes, and why would be your vocalization of the word blue. Uh, I'm sure very few of us would have trouble with that task, but if I were to ask each person here to vocalize step by step the math your brain did to do that transformation, it would be a much more challenging problem. Now, the pro to deep learning is clearly that it's incredibly powerful. It doesn't really matter what X and Y are as long as there's a proper relationship between the two. Uh, in our case, X is all sorts of digital diagnostic data, be it x-rays, CTs, ultrasounds, MRIs, uh, even medical reports, path slides, genomic data, and Y is whatever diagnostic endpoint or insight we're looking to extract from that data. Now, usually that's some sort of segmentation on an image, like a circle around a lung nodule, or maybe some sort of probability associated with the global presence of a finding, like cardiomegaly. Uh, but the drawback of deep learning is that you need a huge number of these XY pairs for the black box to adequately learn the transformation. And in healthcare, both X and Y are very hard to come by. 
Uh, in our case, we gather our input images by working with hospitals, uh, radiology providers, pharmaceutical companies to securely anonymize and transfer that data for our research purposes. But for why, we have to get a little more creative. First, we use natural language models that we've built in-house to ingest the reports that were historically written about each of those images in order to extract possible diagnoses and procedural codes. Uh, here you can see an example of our NLP models assigning a code of uh, patellofemoral joint fracture to this particular report. Now, it would be great if there was a drawing on it associated with it, but at least at this level, it's a global or weak segment uh, or weak label that we can still use for general purposes. It's a good start, but to get to the next step, we heavily rely on human annotations. And so we've built our own sophisticated web-based image labeling platform that we call Image Annotator. And we have a team of 65 part-time radiologists that use this tool in order to label all sorts of study types for us with custom prompts that we build for each specific type of problem. Now, uh, in radiology, nuance is everything. And so all of these problems need to be understood very, very well before they're given off to people. For that reason, every specific model we build comes with about 100 pages of guidelines detailing very specifically what it is that we're looking for because there are a lot of corner cases. Uh, on top of that, we provide all sorts of additional resources to train radiologists in how to do that, including YouTube tutorials, live examples, a Slack community, uh, personal access to a subspecialist in the field, and we qualify each one of them for each specific task by giving them multiple sets of tests along with feedback calls in between. Because if you put garbage in, you get garbage out. And it's critical that we optimize for accuracy here. Now, once you've gathered sufficient examples, you can train your black box model and wrap it in a pretty bow and ship it off in deployment. And if you abstract the problem properly, a single model trained to extract insights from a type of image can be repurposed in all sorts of different types of workflows. In particular, in radiology, we've identified a few particular insertion points. Uh, I would say consider this uh, flow chart that grossly oversimplifies the uh, radiological procedure. But for the most part, a patient comes in and a technician helps take an image of them. The radiologist then interprets that image and generates a report, which they then send off to any other doctors that are involved in the diagnosis or the treatment. Now, we could insert our models at the point where the technician takes the image, but before the radiologist reads it, and we could use it then in order to triage or prioritize that image based on the presence of certain findings. We could say we're so confident it's normal that you can deprioritize this, or we're so confident the patient has an acute finding that you need to look at it right away. Uh, we could even route these cases based on the presence of certain findings to different subspecialists. Uh, we're actually doing a study right now with support from the Canadian government with one of the largest hospital networks in Canada to show this exact effect on head CTs, to see that patients with brain bleeds and strokes get pay, uh, care much faster. Now, alternatively, we could read the image after the radiologist. We could look at both the image and the report they wrote about it, and we could check for errors. Uh, I have a particular example of that right here, where I've got a screenshot of a deployment of that with one of our partners, Capital Health, where we looked in retrospect at all of their chest x-rays that they had interpreted over the course of a couple of years. Uh, the image you see on the left there is the original unprocessed scan. The one on the right has a heat map specific to cardiomegaly. And you can see to the right of that a uh, table comparing what we found in the report versus what we found in the image. And this is a particularly interesting example of that because it's one where the model disagrees with the radiologist. And the uh, radiologist with whom it disagreed was a particularly adamant one who was not happy about this example, uh, especially when we looked up the CT follow-up and were able to prove that he was not correct. <laughs> but I will say very happily that that radiologist has uh, since turned his eye to the world of AI and is now our chief medical officer. <laughs> now, the uh, last main way I would say to insert AI into this would be for real-time diagnostic support. Reading the image alongside the radiologist, acting as their co-pilot uh, to help them find things they otherwise would have missed or not find things that they should not have found. Uh, this is probably what most of us have in mind when we think about these AI solutions. And normally I like to give a live demo of this, but I can see I have about 30 seconds left, so I will try to clip through this very quickly. Uh, I have here screenshots of another live deployment of this in uh, the example of helping doctors screen for lung cancer. And very quickly, you can see here, even at the radiologist's work list level, we're using our natural language models to pull out any risk factors for that patient, 
in order to help them prioritize, as well as telling them how many nodules were found in each scan. And as they jump into that scan, we even walk them through it. You can see here pointing out a finding on a particular slice, and when they interact with that, we automatically scroll them to it, circle it for them, and give them all the characteristic information and malignancy predictions they might be interested in, as well as help them do longitudinal comparisons, uh, pull out example cases based on our training studies in order to help them compare it against something, and ultimately, even go ahead and generate the report for them. And they can disagree with that, usually they don't, uh, but if they do, we capture that feedback, and if we've been monitoring them long enough to know we can trust them, we retrain on that. Uh, the last thing I would say about this that's very exciting to us is in our recent blind tests, we've been finding this model often pick up lung cancer up to 18 months earlier than human radiologists, uh, and that will be the target of a major publication from us in the coming months. Uh, so it's very exciting to start to see those emergent insights, and we're now working to apply this across the vast majority of radiology. Uh, thank you.